So welcome to this segment on anisotropic elasticity. Last time we studied isotropic elasticity, so now we need to think about what happens in the general case where we have an anisotropic media. Um, now, uh, in continuum mechanics, this is unpopular because it, it, it's awkward, as you can see, uh, as we'll find out. Uh, but of course, in material science, we're concerned with the behavior of phases. Um, and most of our phases are actually elastically anisotropic, even cubic crystals. Um, and many of our phases have anisotropy of their thermal expansion coefficient or their diffusivity or their electroconductivity or a whole range of, of properties. And so um, that gives rise to lots of interesting behavior. If you have uh, a whole bunch of grains in a crystal, um, something like this, so on, um, and you pull on them, of course, if they're in different orientations, something I don't know like that for say the 1OO vector, if they strain by different amounts because they're anisotropic, that will give rise to inhomogeneities in the strain field between them, or it would do if, except that they have to stay together, which means you get stress inhomogeneities in between them, um, and those can be quite significant. And if you have uh, elastic, uh, sorry, if you have anisotropy in something like the thermal expansion coefficient, and you're a ceramic, say, and you go up to 1,000 degrees and back down again, or 1500 degrees even, then those strains, can, those mismatch strains can become very, very large and the material can actually pull itself apart without any external load being applied at all. So anisotropy is very, very important in material science um, and that's something uh, why we're going to look at it in some detail here. Um, I should also comment for a second year course, this is quite a big deal um, to do. Uh, many places aren't so bold, um, but actually you've done all the tensor maths, so you should be able to get, get on and do it. So we'll, we'll have a go and see how we do, have some fun. So if we begin, now what we've looked at before is we've looked at a second rank tensor stress, sigma ij, and we've looked at a second rank tensor strain, strain ij, um, and uh, in fact, we want to consider how a strain in some direction, KL, would be related to a stress in another direction, IJ. And those would be related by a fourth rank tensor, CIJ KL. Um, and this is uh, therefore a stiffness tensor. It has units of stress. So if this is in MPA, this will be an MPA, um, or megas and gigas more usually. Um, and this is therefore, if this is a 3x3 three three tensor, and this is a 3x3 three three tensor, this is a 3x3x3x3 three by three by three by three tensor, fourth rank. So this has 81 components. Now, there's uh, an analogy, which is where you uh, would consider what uh, stress gives rise to a strain, and those would be related by a, a stiffness tensor, sorry, by a compliance tensor, which is called S, I, J, K, L. And this is a compliance tensor. Okay, so the notation is the wrong way around. S has the name compliance, and C has the name stiffness. Uh, the only way to remember that, I think, is to remember that they're, they're the wrong way around. And C has units of gigapascals, and therefore S has units uh, usually of terapascals to the minus one. Um, and uh, that's going to be kind of fun. So you can relate those two. If I multiplied, uh, so I'm saying sigma um, is equal to C strain. If I multiply by C to the minus one on either side, on the left, then I can f therefore find that that's the identity tensor, and therefore this C is equal to this S. So C is equal to the inverse of S and vice versa. Um, and that's all sort of fine. Um, sounds like it's going to be a bit of a me bit messy because I don't have a four-dimensional whiteboard. So it's going to be difficult to write down C. Um, it's going to be very difficult indeed. So there is something we can do to reduce the magnitude of the problem of having 81 components. And so that's what we'll do now. And we'll work with the C tensor for the sake of argument. Now, 
Um, one thing is, is that because these are both symmetric tensors, then this must also, that is, C i j k l must be equal to C j i uh, k l, and also C i j k l must be equal to C i j l k, because this is the uh, symmetry in the stress tensor, this is the symmetry in the strain tensor. Okay, um, and that takes you down from having 3 to the 4 is 81 components, that knocks you down actually to having 36 independent components. And uh, if we take an example, then uh, sigma 1, 1 would be equal to, if we write it all out, C1111 strain 1, 1 plus, excuse me, C1112 strain 1, 2 plus C1113 strain uh, 1, 3. And we can keep going through all the components of strain plus C1112 strain 1, 2 plus C1112 strain 2, 2 plus C1123 strain 2, 3 plus, keep going, C1131 strain 3, 1 plus C1132 strain 3, 2 plus C1133 strain 3, 3. Okay, but these are the same so, uh, sorry, I've leapt ahead of myself. Um, that's C1121 strain 21. This component here and this component here are the same, so it doesn't matter what these two are, so we can just write down two of them, and by implication these must be the same. And similarly, this one and this one, we can put a two there, uh, this one and this one, we can put a 2 there and knock out all of those components. So there's only 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And there's only 6 independent strains, so that's your 6 times 6 gives you your 36 independent components here. Okay, so that's how you get your 36 independent components. Um, and that's all well and good. Okay, great. Now, we still have a problem, which is that we can't write this down on a single sheet of paper. And um, what Nye did, and this is in Nye's little book, which is a very good book, um, is he uh, reduced the scope of the imagination problem associated with having with the, the piece of paper. So what he did was he wrote down stress, which has six components, as a vector, sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, sigma 4, sigma 5, and sigma 6. So there's six uh, independent components, you just wrote them down as a vector. Where uh, in the stress matrix, they are as follows, sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3, with the three principal stresses, sigma 1, 1, 2, 2, and 3, 3. Sigma 4 was sigma 2, 3. Sigma 5 was sigma 1, 3. Sigma 6 was sigma 1, 2. And then those are symmetric. So it's like that. And he's said that those two would be equivalent. So he transformed this sigma ij stress matrix into a stress vector sigma i. Okay, and sorry, um, it's not possible to, uh, you, in doing this you've done all sorts of funny things. So you've created a problem that you can't um, now rotate this vector, it's not a tensor anymore, it's just a vector that describes the simultaneous equations if you like. It's not going to have any of the properties of tensors of having uh, three orthonormal basis vectors that you can rotate around. So all of the tensor maths that we've done so far is broken by this, uh, uh, this little trick of writing it down as a vector. But it means that we're going to be able to write C and S down on a single sheet of paper. So similarly for strain, 
did a similar thing, write down strain as a vector, strain 1, strain 2, strain 3, strain 4, strain 5, and strain 6, where the strains come in the, from the strain matrix in the following way. So strain 1, 2, and 3 are the three normal strains. Strain 1, 1, 2, 2, and 3, 3. So that's my strain ij. And he did a similar thing where, but he put some haars in. So this is strain 4. Um, this is strain 5. This is strain 6. So strain 6 here is equal to um, uh, double the value that was in the stress tensor. So strain 6 is equal to 2 times strain ij. And it's symmetric again. And mathematically, when you work it through, that makes sense, uh, because effectively that means these are the shear strains, the simple shear strains, gamma, and that's why you did it. Um, so that makes, uh, sorry, strain a strain vector. So once you've converted your strain and stress tensors to these vectors, you can then do the following. You can then say, that you're going to write down stress is equal to a set of simultaneous equations that are a stiffness matrix. So that's sigma i. This is going to be a stiffness matrix Cij. And that's going to be a strain matrix strain J. Um, and so what we've got is we've got our strain 1, strain 2, strain 3, strain 4, strain 5, strain 6. And here we'll have a stiffness matrix, which is C11, C12, C13, C14, C15, C16, and so on. So C21, C, oops, C22, uh, 31, C3, uh, sorry, 41, C51, C61, C22, C23, C24. Right, so lots of tedious writing out later. We have our, stress mat uh, our stiffness matrix. And what we're saying is, is C11 is the thing that converts a strain 1 to a stress 1. So that's, if you like, your Young's modulus. Um, C12 is what converts a strain in the 2 direction to a stress in the 1 direction. So if you have applied a strain in the 2 direction, that's the stress that would... Uh, be required or be associated with it. So it's a bit weird. It's a, a little bit, th you've got to think a little bit about what the constraints are because it's not just, it's not on the other side. It's not stresses resulting in a strain. This is strains resulting in a stress, which is sort of backwards in a way. Um, and C, uh, therefore C25, say, relates this two stress to the five strain. Um, and then these ones that are shears, C41 uh, relates, it give that, you multiply that row by that column, is the sigma 4 associated with the strain 1. C43, that row times that column, is the, what relates the 4 stress to the 3 strain, and so on. So, and it, in that scheme, there's a direct correspondence between... the four tensor and two tensor stiffnesses. So this is, if you like, a two tensor. So CMN is equal to CIJKL. Uh, that is C23 is equal to C2323 sort of thing. Um, and for S, it's a bit trickier. You have to do some, um, for S, there's a set of rules which are the following, S, M, N, S, I, J, K, L, or 2 S, I, J, K, L, or 4 S, I, J, K, L, depending on, this is M, N, 
is 1, 2, 3. So S, uh, 1, 2, say, is equal to S, 1, 2, 1, 2. For M or N is 4, 5, and 6, that is, um, for one of them is, so M or N is 4, 5, and 6. Then, so that's something like S, 2, 6. That's equal to twice S, um, uh, 2, 2, 6, 6, or something like that. But, and similarly, if it's both, then you have that annoying half in the stra definition of the strain vector um, for when they're both 4, 5, and 6. And that's a bit tricky. Um, but the, the way to, to check it out is to go and check out Nye's book, and that's what I'd recommend if you ever end up wanting to do it for real. Um, but the, the point is is that because you've broken all the tensor maths and all the rotations, the other, another thing you've broken is that these don't invert anymore. So it's not the case that Cij in this scheme is equal to the inverse of Sij. It's not true. Um, and that's uh, a bit of a problem. Um, and it also doesn't rotate. So to use this, these are usually referred to the 100 type axes, at least if you're talking about cubic crystals. Um, and therefore, uh, what we um, need to do is we need to rotate our stress state to the 100 axes, find, or our strain state, find the corresponding other one, stress or strain, using CRS as appropriate, and then rotate back to put it back into a tensor and then rotate back to our original set of axes. So it's all going to be a bit involved, but it does mean we can at least write it down on a single sheet of paper. Now, um, you can go a bit further than this. Uh, Nye makes an energy argument based on strain energy to say that Cij must be equal to Cji, that is, that must be a symmetric matrix, and that takes you down from 36 to 21 components. And that's still completely generic. And they're actually, it, for a cubic crystal, you can reduce it even further. For a hexagonal crystal, nearly as far, but not quite. And for a cubic crystal, um, you can say that shear on any face must be the same on any 100 face. So these three guys, sorry, these three guys, C44, C55, and C66 must be the same. So we've got our stress matrix, uh, our stiffness matrix, and we call them all C44. Um, and the same is true for the normal stress. So C11, 22, and 33 must be the same. And the press on contraction must also be the same in any direction, which means C12 has to be the same. Um, and when you, you look at a cubic crystal, shear on one axis can't produce a shear on another one. And normal stresses can't produce shears and vice versa. So all of these are also all zero. So you have three, so for cubic, your 21 reduces down to three independent components. And if it's hexagonal, actually you end up with five, as it turns out. So that's how uh, anisotropic elasticity is defined. And what we'll go on to do is we'll do a couple of problems where we'll see how this makes sense and how to apply that to look at what the stiffness is of a crystal in different directions and so forth. So that's where we'll go next.